Dorset Heathland is a simple, smooth-shouldered landscape, broken only by sharp silhouettes of gorse and pine. In his Wessex novels, Thomas Hardy immortalised this landscape. When other things sink brooding to sleep, he wrote, the heath appeared to awake and listen. Nobody could be said to understand the heath who had not been there at such a time. Winter has its own magic, but from mid-May until the end of September, the soul of the heath seems to come alive in the hours between the afternoon and night. If you are lucky, you can see it, but almost always you can hear it, the strange rattling purr of the nightjar. Painting in the half-light is difficult, but in the glow of a gas lamp I can work until dark. It's the only way to tackle a twilight bird, like the nightjar. Nightjars spend the winter in Africa, migrating north for the summer to breed in dry, open habitats with well-spaced trees. Heathland is an ideal landscape for them, and over much of their British range, they are dependent on it. As the light fails, Colours change fast, so my mixes become an impression of what I'm seeing. With its fluttering moth-like flight, the nightjar twists and turns, scooping insects from the air, habits that earned it the other common name of nighthawk. During the day, nightjars lie silent and motionless on the ground, or sometimes lengthways on a branch, protected by their cryptic coloration that makes them virtually undetectable. Their large eyes closed to mere slits. They feed largely on moths. The long, stiff bristles around the upper bill help steer flying insects into the enormous gape. The plumages of both sexes are very similar, but the male shows distinct white panels on the wings. On a female, the spots are either much paler or absent altogether. If threatened at the nest, they rely on camouflage until danger approaches to within meters. Then they fly up and feign injury close by to distract attention away from the nest. Disturbance is one factor that in recent years has contributed to the nightjar's decline. But the biggest problem has been the drastic reduction of their habitat over the past hundred years. For anybody with an eye for landscape and a passion for wildlife, Heathland is exceptional. I value greatly its simple shapes and gentle curves, its skylines and silhouettes. It is an uncluttered landscape of basic earthy hues, with slabs of cadmium yellow and magenta to highlight the gorse and heather in flower. Lowland Heath has a fabulous community of flora and fauna. Some species are extremely rare in Britain, among them the silver-studded blue butterfly. The dwarf shrub community of plants, dominated by heather, is characteristic of heathland vegetation. It developed on poor, usually acid soils, in temperate, humid climates. Here in Dorset, I am trying to capture a habitat that is rare in the world. In Britain, we are custodians of 40% of the world total of lowland heaths. Gorse is vital for the survival of one very special heathland bird, the Dartford warbler. This is a male, maintaining a hold on its territory with bursts of song. If to me the nocturnal nightjar represents the soul of the heath, then the cocky Dartford warbler, busy and noisy throughout the day, represents its lively heart. The Dartford warbler is a bird more at home in the dry scrub of Mediterranean hills, but here in Britain, at the northern edge of its European range, it finds an acceptable substitute on dry heathland. 
Unlike all our other warblers that migrate to warmer climates for the winter, the Dartford warbler lives on the heath all year round. Gorse is the key to the survival of this warbler, as it holds a sufficient supply of insect food for most of the year. The stonechat, this one also a territorial male, is another resident bird of the heath. The heathlands of southern Britain are important homes for reptiles too, particularly the adder, the sand lizard, and the smooth snake. Although lowland heath may have the look of a landscape unchanged for thousands of years, it has not evolved naturally, but was created by the clearance of the prehistoric forest for agriculture. Clearings cut in the great wildwood by ancient people created the open conditions that Heather preferred, and traditional grazing methods maintained its openness. Heathland and the use of other common land became important in the rural economy. Potash for fertilizer was obtained by burning bracken. Wood was gathered and gorse and peat turves were cut for fuel. Heathland provided thatching materials and plenty of rough grazing. These activities maintained the heath's open character and its economic value ensured its survival. In the past 200 years though, all that has changed. Almost 90% of the once great unenclosed wild of Dorset has now vanished, since it became profitable enough to enclose and claim for more intensive agriculture. Large tracts of poorer heath were abandoned and neglected to be claimed once more by trees and scrub. The fragments of old heath still remaining now face the biggest threat of all, development. To those with no sympathy for the natural world, no love of wildlife or no eye for landscape, Heathland remains an untidy wasteland. A definition enthusiastically adopted by planners and developers who view heaths as the best place to lay new roads, build industrial and housing estates, extract aggregates and infill with rubbish. The only beneficiaries are scavengers like black-headed and herring gulls. Heathland's new urban neighbours look to it for their recreation. Bikers do the most damage, tearing up the heath, crisscrossing it with barren tracks of sand, the scream of engines scattering the wildlife. Even horse riding can create problems. Tracks get wider and wider, cutting through natural corridors and isolating small invertebrates. But in the past decade, the most damage has been done by commercial development that has consumed huge areas of heath. A battle is on to save what is left. This, believe it or not, was actually the middle of Thomas Hardy's Egdon Heath. Now, all that remains of that is about 960 acres. We're surrounded by housing on every side. So, although, in a sense, the development is stopping, the problem that I have facing me here are things from people that are harming the heath now. We have a fire problem, we have motorbike problems, stolen motorcycles come here, set on fire, which set off the heath. Uh, we have the ever-increasing problem of mountain bikes. 
we have joggers that you wouldn't think would cause much trouble, but in fact they come out dressed like Christmas trees in pink and yellow and a fluorescent green, running around the heath disturbing all the birds. Horse riding is becoming an increasing problem. Now I've no objection to people using the heath in that way, providing they do it with a little bit of common sense and dress for the occasion. If they're going to come and utilise the heath and I have to allow them to do it, then I want them to do it in possibly a reasonable way. Apart from the human aspect, we've got all the physical management problems. Um, at this point in time, we don't have a budget, so I have to rely on volunteers. So it's labour-intensive all the way, rather than using tractors and bush harvesters and uh, the sort of expensive mechanical things that I need. All I need now is masses of manpower in bracken for a start, and we've got acres and acres of bracken to get rid of. We don't have the budget for the chemical, and short of someone sponsoring a helicopter so we can spray the bracken, the only way we can get rid of it is literally by cutting it year after year after year. There's about 30, 40 acres of bracken here. So with your team of volunteers and the work, your management work you're doing, is the Canford Heath safe for the future? Well, it's safe in the sense that uh, the development company which own this heath have put it, are about to put it into trust. We're actually putting it into a trust fund at this moment in time. If that trust fund has the finance, I mean, for instance, the, the trust will be funded by the fact that a road has got to go through. And that r road has been planned since 1933 and they're still arguing over it. We're in a situation now where the conservationists don't object to the, the route that is uh, under revision at the moment. But I have no doubt that that will go to a public review which is going to take another five to seven years. Now, from my point of view, when the road goes through, it'll be like a human cattle grid. So it will mean that that part of the heath will be safe. But up until that point, we've still got all those people coming from that area over, setting light to it, riding their motorbikes on it, uh, and generally abusing it. Past attitudes of planners and developers are clearly visible here. Only one more exit from this roundabout remained to be built the one across the heath. But conservation pressure has since altered its route. This abandoned road scheme, however, is a permanent scar on Canford and shows a cynical disregard for precious heathland. Fire is another threat, but one from which heaths can largely recover. Fire was once a management tool, but now that heathland is so diminished, it's a dangerous one to use. The eye must be quick to catch one of the heath's greatest delights, the hobby, a supremely elegant and agile falcon that is a paragon among European birds of prey. Sketching birds in flight is something that always excites me, an attempt to capture the essence of a bird. The single sudden dash of a passing hobby is not enough, the action must be repeated. The longer the observation, and the more frequently the action is repeated, the nearer I feel I get to distilling that essence. I've missed out this time. The wings are too pointed. Hobbies are largely confined to South and East Britain, frequenting downs and open farmland. But heaths are a particularly favoured habitat, a landscape that fulfils their every need. They feed largely on small birds, particularly swallows and martins, which they catch in flight. But flying insects are also important prey for them. The aerial agility of this fabulous falcon never fails to excite. I could watch them for hours. Long ago, when the great wild wood covered large parts of the British Isles, the hobby would have found difficulty in finding a home. But forest clearance and agriculture, which opened up the landscape, favoured its needs, so long as tall stands of trees were left for them to nest in. Hobbies are relatively late breeders, having young in the nest in July and August. At this time of year, there are lots of young, small and inexperienced birds already on the wing, easy prey for this aerial predator. This meal looks like a pipit or a skylark. The downy chick is a few days younger than the others. It's a kind of insurance policy. Its nestmates have a head start 
and being bigger and stronger, are usually the first to grab the food. If the food supply is plentiful, the smallest will eventually get a meal. If not, it will perish. Although hobbies need open landscapes, they are not totally dependent on heathland. But the loss and fragmentation of heath certainly doesn't help them. Martin Old is the Dorset Heathlands Project Officer for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and keeps a close watch on every aspect of this precious habitat. Martin, looking at the heath as an outsider, and reading the press cuttings, it's easy to feel depressed about what's happened to Heathland. Is there any cause for optimism? Oh yes, I think there's tremendous cause for optimism. Five years ago, I would have ag agreed with you that things were looking pretty awful as far as Heathland was concerned. But today, with the production of the Dorset Heathland strategy, and many of the changes, the seed changes in people's views, I think Heathland has a chance of survival in the long term, certainly from external threats but we need to look at the internal threats to the, to the heathen blocks that are left, the fragments that are left. There are many threats due to the lack of traditional systems of heathland management. Many heathlands are no longer used for the traditional things that they were, like grazing, for example, and because of that lack of management, we've now run into invasion of many heathlands by birch and pine and bracken, rhododendron. And we need to get at that and solve that problem uh, if they're to survive in the long term. So what are you hoping for from this Heathland management? We in the society hope through the Heathland Management Project to see a turnaround in the decline of 10% per decade, which has occurred at least over the last three decades, to a 10% increase in the area of open Heathland in the next decade. As well as recreating Heathland and carefully managing what's left, it's necessary to repair some of the damage already done. On Canford, a team of volunteers is involved in cutting invasive trees and reseeding areas destroyed by motorbikes. The work of repairing, regenerating and managing heath is vital if birds and other wildlife are to find the habitat they need in coming years. 50 feet up in the pines, two of the three young hobbies are building up their strength in preparation for their first flight. For the most part, Heathland is a dry, sandy soiled landscape, but here and there are wet hollows boggy pools and ponds, tranquil corners that have plenty to delight the eye. As the wetness increases, so does the diversity of heathland flora and fauna. Cotton grass, bog asphodel, and spongy mats of dripping sphagnum moss encrusted with sundews. Wet Heathland is also home to an exceptional variety of skimmers, chasers and hawkers, the dragonflies, the four-spotted chaser, the keeled skimmer, and the small red damsel. Jewels in the sunlight that tempt hobbies in search of a snack on the wing. In late summer, without the pressures of feeding their young, hobbies turn back to feeding on flying insects. Hobbies are agile birds designed for swift flight. Slender bodies and long, scythe-shaped wings. 
They are skillful but opportunistic hunters. And in slow motion, you can appreciate their winnowing beats and alternating glides. Then, a perfectly controlled lightning snatch to pluck a dragonfly from the air. They will also take other insects, like cockchafers, door beetles and flying ants. Capturing that moment of action is difficult, but worth a try, as it is so characteristic of the bird. A quick glance at a hobby could confuse it with a kestrel or merlin, but its wing action and size are important clues. But feeding on the wing like this, it is unmistakable. If you watch for long enough, the details of its dark plumage, striking head pattern and heavily streaked underparts enable the sexes to be told apart. They are very similar. This is a female. The upper parts, although dark slate coloured, are tinged brown. The male is smaller and the upper parts are slaty blue-black. But both have the red chestnut leggings and undertail. The feet and toes are small as befits a hunter that is both delicate enough to catch a damselfly but powerful enough to catch a swift in flight. The hobby would have been a regular summer visitor to the vast tracts of unenclosed wild that Thomas Hardy knew. To the eye, Heathland has a timeless, untouched look about it. From prehistoric times as unaltered as the stars overhead, as Hardy believed. In truth, of course, its very existence has resulted from human activity over thousands of years. Hardy created imaginary Egdon Heath from a dozen actual heaths that stretched in a great swathe virtually from Bournemouth to Dorchester. In Hardy's words, Egdon was a great inviolate place and civilization was its enemy. It is ironic that human activity and the civilization of housing estates, factories, theme parks and roads are on the brink of destroying forever the few remaining fragments of that once great inviolate place. We must not let it happen.